Okay, I was asked to ask to introduce myself, something I haven't done in the past year. I'm David Kahanov, and I'm happy to be here and to continue with the last installment for the topic of Ashkoch HaProtis, the dimension of Ashkoch HaProtis, the way Chassidus teaches us what Ashkoch HaProtis is. So, we're going to focus tonight on some of the general points of Ashgach HaProtis, how it applies to us now. And closer, I'm good like this, it's whatever you want. First thing we have to know, we spoke a little bit about how the Torah itself tells us certain things of the way to understand these stories or these episodes is that the Torah is giving us this information in order for us to know the greatness of Hashem, what Hashem has been doing for us. We spoke about different stories that are brought in Maimar, Chazal, and Gemara, and so on. So I just want to mention that there's something that stands out that I didn't mention last time, which is we know that the whole ceremony of Pesach, of the Seder table, is all about to bring about a, a, a curiosity to make the children uh, have questions, want to know more. It's almost like we have to make sure we do all these things so they should ask on their own. As we say every day in the Vaidaber, we put on Beir Tams, Kisholcha Bincha, we got it to live in Cha. And it seems like with everything that's going on, the focus is on the children. And what is the focus on the children? That they should ask a question. Why should they ask the question? So then they will be told and they'll get the information, they'll get the answer. Now, this is unusual because the Torah tells us mitzvahs and tells us what to do to teach our children, to tell our children, to train our, church, our children, to educate them, but to do certain mysterious things, which oh, is only for the sake of arousing curiosity, seems to be a little bit the unusual. And so many of the things that we do are only for the sake of curiosity and only for the children. Don't worry about it. We also have to ask questions and... Uh, as you know, the Rebbe t- s- speaks, and it's mentioned many times that a person is not only young or old according to their age, a person is young or old according to their level of knowledge. So the children symbolize, and they represent this idea that the question has to come from within the person who doesn't know, and there has to be an interest, and there has to be a desire to want to know. Washing our hands before karpas is simply kedela hatmi atinoikas. Is only to, there is no point in it as far as a, a commemoration, as far as something that was done for the sake of uh, the Torah telling us, or for the sake of memorializing and remembering and marking this uh, this uh, action. No, it's only literally to be to create a curiosity, and many other things that we do is for them to ask the questions. And the Rebbe explains, and it's explained elsewhere as well, that there's a big difference if a question is asked and then there's an answer given, or if the answer or the information is given, not as an answer to a question. When someone asks a question, it bothers the person. He is interested, he wants to know. He needs to know. And to the point that there are cases when something is so um, is so is so a person is so anxious to know the answer to a question that they lose sleep over it, and they can't rest. Sometimes you ask someone a good riddle, wake up and continue thinking about it. There are hidden, holy hidden, and there's a whole safer called Charles the Chuvus Ben Hashemayim. Questions and answers from heaven. And the work, this, he, this wasn't the only individual, but he has a whole safer. But when you're talking about holy people, big scholars and, and, uh, and tzaddikim, 
If they have a question in their learning, it means so much to them that in their sleep they think of the question. And when the neshama goes up, because they're so holy and because they care so much about getting an answer, for the right reasons, l'shma, so they, they receive answers from above. And then when they wake up, they remember it. And in this case, the person printed a sefer, shalas a tshuvas So there's a big difference if it's, if it's uh, something that someone knew enough, and you were the one that asked the question, and you're the one seeking an answer. So when it comes to Pesach, um, the Torah wants us to care. The Torah wants us to care, to know. It should be something that makes us curious. And therefore, the answer that will be given will mean so much more. In this case, the Torah wants every Yid to live with Yitzhiya Mitzrayim. To feel like he went through Yitzhiya Mitzrayim. And he'll be able to understand and have much, a much greater clarity in what direction his life should take, what he should focus on. Because as you know, Yitzhiya Mitzrayim stands for so many important things. The main thing is that we all have to go out of our own challenges, our own obstacles, our own hurdles within our own lives, not like in the case of Mitzrayim when it was phys- they were physically enslaved. But the idea is always here. We have our limitations, we have our struggles. And Yitzhiya Mitzrayim, living with it the right way, and it's so important to live with Yitzhiya Mitzrayim all the time, that we say it so many times a day. And whenever we do anything, we mention Yitzhiya Mitzrayim whether it's making Kiddush on Yom Tov, Zeichel Etzies Mitzrayim, the third parsha in Kriya Shema is because of the, the, the um, importance of mentioning Yitzies Mitzrayim. So it was put in there for that purpose, for that sake. And we say it, we're going to say it soon, about Kriya Shem We say as Yashir every day. Yitzies Mitzrayim is something so important and it's so intrinsic in our Yiddishkeit it's all about what we have to live with not because of of the past because the past that gives us the right way to live for the present and for the future not getting into Yitzhiz Mitzrayim now it's not a Shiri Yitzhiz Mitzrayim but who has to initiate the question who has to be puzzled who has to want to know that is the asker. The person who doesn't know has to be brought to want to know. And it's very much part of the whole idea of Hashkoch Pratis. Hashkoch Pratis is where there is an answer. There's a clear communication. There's a clear message. But there's one condition for Hashkoch Pratis. Otherwise, it's not called Hashkoch Pratis. Why isn't it called Hashkoch Pratis? Because the Abish is always in charge and controlling and setting everything up and causing it to happen in this way or in that way with so many layers that there could be so many things happening for so many causes at the same time. And no one denies that because that's part of Amun and the Ebishter. So what is this thing that we call Hashgoch HaPratis? Hashgoch HaPratis is on the part of the individual, is on the part of the Yid, is on the part of the recognition. That means Hashkoch HaPratis, when you call it Hashkoch HaPratis, you're not just calling it by the meaning of the words, the translation of the words. You're calling it because it's a discovery, because it's a recognition, because it clicked. I got it. It's there, but if I wouldn't have cared to pay attention, if I wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been looking for that, I would have never noticed it. So it's a focus. And it's a mindset. What is the mindset? What is the focus? The focus is, where am I looking? What am I looking for? What do I need? I want to see Hashem in every little episode, in every incident, in every occurrence. And if I want to see Hashem in every occurrence, that's what I'm going to see. Remember when we were children, when my father would get a new car, don't worry, it wasn't new, it was used, but it was a new used car. 
Sometimes it was older than the car before, so there's nothing to do with new in that sense. Suddenly we began to notice all the cars on the road that were the same. Before that we didn't notice it. It's almost like everybody bought the same car because my father had it. Going on the highway and you see so many. Why? Because we're looking for it. We're focused in that direction. So the Torah tells us, I want you to know that you're going to get the answers. But it has to come, you're a partner here. It has to come on your part that you care and you're looking for it. And then the message, the sign will come. When it's a sign for you, it'll come for you. And when it comes, your job is to be ready. Your job is to be in the right place at the right time. That means don't be distracted with something. You know, the Rebbe talks about baseball, a message of baseball to a child becoming by mitzvah. How many people look at baseball the way the Rebbe looks at baseball? A beautiful lesson. The players don't leave. They stay till the end. And all oh, the chess, the Rebbe wants to bring them chess. He said a long sikha about this. An amazing, amazing lesson. And yet, a lot of people go, go physically. The Rebbe doesn't go physically. He didn't go physically to watch a game. They go physically to watch a game. They know every player and they know every detail about the guy, even his shoe size and his, and his uh, exact age and his birthday and his weight. And they know his, uh, they know his friends and they know his, his family. You know, it's like we become so obsessed with, because we care so much. So what are we noticing? We're noticing what kind of glove he's using. We notice things that are, have no, no meaning, no significance. But then you have a Rebbe, you have a Yid, the way he's supposed to look at something. It says, hey, there's a game over here. And there's something to it that is going to help us understand the Eibishter. And something we can learn from that's going to help us with our Avedah Hashem. And there's a whole book printed on different uh, cases that the Rebbe brings in the world. An accountant, uh, a doctor, washing the needle before you uh, prick the person, the patient. An endless amount, I mean, not endless, endless, but you could see that this could be done with anything. The Rebbe is giving us the formula. And the Rebbe teaches us so many beautiful things in Avedis Hashem. The Rebbe speaks about the lesson of a rocket ship. And at some point, when there's no more gravity, when there's weightlessness, and part of the rocket is not needed anymore to push it forward, to push it upwards, it continues on its own inertia. And the Rebbe gives us a beautiful muscle. It's when you reach a point. First, you need all the force, a tremendous, tremendous force. It's an explosion. The place near, in this area, in the area of the rocket launching is shaking. And the noise is, is, is huge. So that's when a person is struggling to get out of level one, to get off the ground, to get out of resistance and then he has to really struggle but then you reach a point that you still have to continue upwards but you abandoned the resistance you got through that you passed it and now you're continuing onward without something pulling you back now it's you yourself you're trying to break your own record okay so these are examples so we could take so many of these examples it's interesting how far we go with this hole that the person should know. The person should know, and in this case, we're making sure that the child knows because that's when you, you get your foundation for life. And we're assuming already that the older person knows this because he was a child and his parents made sure to get him to ask questions. But this is in general. The person in his own private life, I don't mean in general for the multitudes, each person individually, how he is going to break out of his own restrictions. We have another case also connected to Mitzrayim very strongly, and that is the case of when Paray was resisting, and Paray was defying what Hashem said through Moshe Rabbeinu over time and time again, and in the several cases, the Abishah says, I'm going to make his heart 
his heart hard. I'm going to harden his heart. Why? What's the reason why the Mitzrayim are getting all these plagues? The reason is so they should know. So they should know the, the Egyptians. And that would be the logical understanding. That those that are going against, are rebelling against the Abish, denying Hashem's existence. The party says, who's Hashem? I don't even know. I don't even know who he is. You know, have we met? You know, I am, I created myself. So, and the Mitzrayim were definitely in with him together. They had their own self-motivation to make it harder for the Yidden and to torture the Yidden. So the Abish says, I'm going to break them. But I'm going to break them slowly. So they learned their lesson. Mitzrayim represents Klippa. They learned their lesson and they're going to come around and recognize my greatness and submit to the godliness instead of to their own worshiping themselves practically. But then in Pasha's boy, a curveball comes in from nowhere. Abisha tells Moshe Rabbeinu, Uleman, you know why I'm sending you to Parai? Tisaper, you should tell Oznei Bincho, Ven Bincho, in the ears of your children, you should tell them, Eisa Sheri Salal Tibi Mitzrayim, the way I amused myself, the way I played with Mitzrayim, I made a mockery of them. Ve'es Eis Eisai, and my wonders, that I placed onto them, and you're going to know that I'm Hashem. It's, it's, it, it has nothing to do, the Yidden don't have to know anything. They didn't rebel against the Abishta. Why suddenly does this become the focus? And the Rebbe asks this question. And the Rebbe says a, one, a tremendous principle that we have to keep in mind because this is really right along the lines of Ashgach Abratis. Because you could ask yourself a question. Why do I have to know that in this thing there's Hashem, in that thing is Hashem? I'm perfectly okay believing in Hashem. I'm perfectly okay, okay that Hashem creates me every moment. I'm perfectly okay with everything. But why do I have to prove to myself that in this little episode, in this little event, in this little occurrence, why do I have to know and see it for myself? I trust. You know, there's uh, once a student, he said, I, I don't have a Gemara. He says, how could you learn if you don't have a Gemara? I trust, I, I trust the, the sages, I trust them. And I trust you, whatever you're saying, they say, I trust. But why is, does it have to be in every little tiny detail? Why is it such an important thing? Why is it such, such a mainstay in being a Yid? And the Rebbe explains, when we say, the created the world, for two Things that are racist, that are beginnings or firsts. One is Taira, the other one is Yidden. So let me ask you a question. We don't have anything if not for us existing. I don't know anyone who buys a shirt for no one. I don't know anyone who buys food for no one. I don't know who builds a house or buys a house for no one. Because all these things are only means, they're not ends. So a Yid has to remember from this Bereshis that there's only the Yid. And if there's anything else, it's only because the Yid exists and whatever else there is that exists is there for the Yid. Take the Yid out of the equation, then there's nothing. No one goes to work and doesn't get paid. There's that central point, center point. There's that main reason, it could look very small, but if that 10 seconds or five seconds that it takes to uh, the, uh, the payroll department, to, to wire it to the bank, uh, click it through, if that doesn't happen, then all the things that are so much of an importance to the person, a vehicle to get to work, an alarm clock to wake up, skills and studying to be able to qualify and know the job and 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 all the other things that go on which is the majority the vast majority the overwhelming majority compared to that one second or two seconds or even 10 seconds but without that there would be no reason where you're going i'm going to work 
Oh, nice. So you must be earning a living. No, no, I don't earn a living, but I'm going to work. Doesn't work. <laughs> work doesn't work without money. Because the whole purpose of work is money. If not, it's a hobby, so it's a different story. No one goes to buy food and then puts it straight in the garbage can. Because if a person wouldn't have to eat, the whole music industry, if there wouldn't be such a thing called sound, we wouldn't have the ability to hear. To us now, it sounds like it's impossible, but Hashem could have created us that way. Just vision, no sound. Would there be a music industry for billions and trillions of dollars? Would there be all these, um, I call it headphones, but these days it's called pods or something. Would it be anything, all the gadgets and gizmos and all these entertainers and all these things and, and composers and it would be nothing. And someone says, no, I still like the music industry. You know, there would be no such name and there would be no such idea, but I'm saying, let's say, somehow he knew that there's such a concept, but it doesn't exist. It wouldn't be there. Says the Taira. I want you to know, my Rabbeinu, says the Ebishter. It's true that I'm doing all this to punish and to give the Mitzrayim a tough lesson. And I want them to recognize me because they're denying me. But ultimately, if it doesn't have a meaning to a Yid, there wouldn't be Mitzrayim here and the whole thing wouldn't be happening. So you see again the idea of Ashkach Pratis, which gives us a whole new understanding, a new dimension in Ashkach Pratis, which is there can't be anything going on that I am privy to, I'm exposed to, I know about it, whether hearing it or seeing it or feeling it, and there shouldn't be a lesson for me. Now, in many cases, we need a Rebbe, we need Taira to teach us how you understand to learn lessons from things that are not so clearly understood. And then you can get better at it, make sure you learn the right, the right principles that should be according to Taira, it shouldn't be against um, the principles of Taira, and then you do it yourself, you get better at it, and so on. But you see in Taira, everything is focused towards the awareness and recognition of the Jew. It can't be, even when the Torah is saying, I want uh, this and this uh, nation, this and this uh, wicked man, Haman, whoever, Parai, to know, and I want him to learn a lesson, and I want him to be forced to concede. The Yid knows about this, right? The Yid has to learn a lesson from that too. Not just that Hashem is great. How does it affect me personally in this particular kind of scenario? It's not enough to say Hashem is great. Because we can go and look at the mountains every day, Dafka, something that we choose we want to look at, and that should be our, our connection. That should be our channel to see how great Hashem is. Well, Hashem made the mountain. He's even greater than the mountain. And every day, it has to be in all flavors, in all forms. Because if anything is left out, then in my experience, in my life, it doesn't include Hashem in it. So you're going to say, yeah, but it does, but I don't know. If I don't know, that means I am not allowing it to be what it is because it's only there for me to know. But everybody else knows, good, but it's missing you. That means it's lacking its true existence. It's lacking its true spark of godliness because it's not just there for Yankel and Beryl. It has to be that every single existence is expressing something to every single creation. Conscious creations, intelligent creations, those are human beings. The ones who are wired to understand these things and see these things, those are Yidin. Because Yidin have Baruch Hashem, a spark of God in, inside, and they have this gift because of this spark, they're focused on the right things. Okay, so let's continue. Now, once we know the idea of, of uh, Ashkoch HaPlotis and how central it is and how re- much it's important, even if it has nothing to do with the person whatsoever. But the fact that the person is aware of such, of such an existence, of such an occurrence, 
it automatically is very strongly connected, maybe even more than the thing itself that it happened to. Because the human being is so much more key to creation than whatever it was that it happened to. And it wouldn't, it, that, that thing would have never existed, as I just said, or it would have never happened to it. The Baal Shem Tev once sent Koyin, what was his name? Rappaport, right? What was his first name? In the Kutu Diburim. It's the beginning of the Kutu Diburim, the story there. He sent him to drink water from a, from, a, from, a, from, a, from, a, from a river or from a brook. And he sent him to learn some Taira by a person's, by a certain residence. And later it was explained to him that there was a Jew who wasn't a God-fearing man. He sat and learned. He loved to learn. He had a passion for learning. And he learned Taita. We don't have to say that he changed what's said there. We don't have to say he even changed the understanding that should fit him better. Because he liked Taita as the Taita was, but he only appreciated it as an intellectual study. As something that's wisdom. He enjoyed the wisdom. It's profound. Many, many Goyim, non-Jews and Jew haters like bishops and all these uh, religious, uh, anti-Jewish religions, they were very uh, learned. The Vatican, they have all that stuff and there's all these monks and honks and all that. They're all learning. They all know a lot of them. And they don't even have any need or use for any Jew, on the contrary, but they like it. He didn't learn it because it was God's title, because he sat there with a dog next to him. Nothing's wrong with a dog in itself. I'm not saying you can't be from with a dog and have a dog, but this is who he was. And without a yarmulke, and he didn't eat kosher, and he hung around and partied with all these terrible uh, and people that are not particularly aligned with Judaism. And the problem is that there was a lot of Torah there. And it's Hashem's Torah that he was studying. So he sent this, um, I forgot his name, Chaim Rappaport. He sent him to, he was a Koyan. He sent him there to learn Torah. And through his learning Torah there, it elevated the whole learning that was learned there. And it was stuck. It couldn't go up. To Shemayim, which is what happens when a Yid learns Torah, he elevates that Torah back to its source, where it comes from, is to the Ebershta. Now, someone tells you such a story. You say to yourself, this is stuff that we can't see with our own eyes. This seems like this is like some kind of a, some kind of a practice, uh, some black magic or some other kind of, uh, the answer is that we can't see, but we're still given the glasses to be able to see through the eyes of Torah, through the eyes of Tzaddikim, and we could learn how to see those things that we do see, but we don't focus on them. So how do you look at everything you see? The Torah tells us also, in last week's Pasha, why do we have to learn Chsidis? People say, you have to learn Chsidis because you'd have to know how to be a good Jew. Practice-wise. That's a very important thing too. I want to know how to daven, so I'll daven better. I want to be able to understand what the mitzvahs are, so I'll do them better. It's all nice and good, and that's very important. That's another reason. But then there's the mitzvah to know Hashem. The mitzvah to know Hashem, the first four prokem in the Rambam's Chibur uh, in the Rampam's volumes of Mishnah Torah, the first volume, the first prokem, the first four prokem is all about the mitzvah of Yediyah Hashem, knowing Hashem for the sake of knowing Hashem, not only in order to be able to practice or know the laws or know the, even the soul of the mitzvah, but it's to know your own soul and it's to know and be connected to Hashem, which will motivate you to want to be one with him and to cleave to him, not only to motivate you to do a mitzvah, to love him and to fear him. What do I need to fear or love Hashem if I'm doing the mitzvah? I promise you, I'm very committed. I'm going to do that mitzvah. I'm never, I, 
not one day is going to pass without me putting on film. Isn't that what it's about? It is what it's about to a, to a large degree, and that's why the action of a mitzvah is what counts more than the meditation. But the love for Hashem, that's a mitzvah of the heart. What does it mean to love Hashem? If a person sees Hashgach Abrotis, his whole relationship with Abisha changes dramatically. It's no longer impersonal. It's very personal. It's very intimate. And that's why all these things that the Torah is telling us, that we as those that are just maybe spectators, we're, we are in the, we're on the side, we're members of the press, not members that are depressed, members of the press, we are aware of it. But it's not me. It's like crime in New York. You just look the other way and you go. No. It's not only that you're responsible for others and it might come to use for you for whatever reason, on a practical level. No. It's that this information, this knowledge, this awareness is part of what shapes you. And you can't say, I don't need it. I'm shaped enough without it. I'll just miss out on this because then the Abishta will never show it to you. Which means you're leaving out. It's like I'll take every 70th breath, I'll skip. I mean, you're probably thinking, oh, so you breathe a lot. I'm talking about that one that's key for to stay alive. <laughs> the one that you have to breathe when, when the time comes to breathe. Okay. Why is all this? So, so far we're talking about a connection, a relationship with Abishan, awareness, enhancing your whole appreciation for Hashem's greatness and for who Hashem is and what Hashem is and what it means to you. But there's a whole other dimension here. And that dimension is the main reason for creation. Yeah, the Yid, Taira. We are the main reason for the world's existence because we're the ones that are going to be using the world to serve Hashem. So we're the most important. And the Torah, of course. The Torah and the Yidin. That's what is needed to serve Hashem. But why do we have to serve Hashem? Two words. Dira betachtoinim. And that's even more deeper. It's even deeper. And more of a reason why this whole business exists. Of course, the yid is so high. The yid's higher than the world, of course. But Dir B'Tachtainim is a mission that is all about the yid being the center of it. So it's not like we're saying there's yid and there's Dir B'Tachtainim. Why? Because the yid makes it happen. And Hashem hired a couple of workers. And to be this kind of worker, you have to come from a Jewish father, Jewish mother, and, uh, and, you, have to, and you have to practice Judaism. So that's how you do the job. But when you do the job, you are a worker that's doing a job. No. You are the whole purpose for Dira B'Tachtoinim. But it's a separate idea. One thing is, Hashem is way up there. And I'm down here. So I'm going to make a place. You know, a big king has palaces in many places. I'm going to make a palace for the king down here. As far as I'm concerned... Traditionally, the soul is working its way back up. It comes down and it wants to go back to its source. That was always the focus. And of course, it's very real and it's very true. Because there was a time that the central focus wasn't the ultimate redemption. So within the smaller frame a year has to want to go back he wants to go higher up into the higher worlds reconnect with his source reconnect with the in in the higher um, godly uh, realms and so on but then the abish to really oh that means behind everything and everything has its own its own value ultimately there's a mission, simultaneously, there's a, a bigger mission, which is more general. Not for the individual soul, for the individual to be more spiritual, more godly. Because there's nothing to talk about. The spirituality is much more than down here, uh, up there than down here. No one's going to deny that. No one's saying that this is uh, not a physical world. 
because down here there has to be a place for Hashem. It's, on the contrary, it's the very physicality of the world that qualifies it to be dafke over here and not up there. But let's not run ahead of ourselves. So, dira betachtainim. What does it mean, dira betachtainim? For the people, by the people, of the people. It means we're tachtainim because we're creations from Hashem and we're in this world, we're physical creations. Everything around us is tachtainim, the lower existences in this low physical world, which is, normally speaking, and on the surface, it's the furthest point from Hashem. It's the furthest point from Kedusha, from holiness. And that is the catch. The catch is that Hashem is so great that I'll have a, a palace, I'll have a, a dwelling place, even over here, even in such a far place. But that's just to Hashem to prove that He has, He extends everywhere. And there's nowhere where He has no uh, reign. He doesn't have any control, any rulership, any access. But no one would disagree that the main place for Hashem is in the heavens, above. No, it's not the case. Hashem wants this to be His main dwelling place. Now, here's how the whole thing of Ashkach Pratis comes into the picture. What does it mean that Hashem is here? If a person is someplace, just by merely being there, and nothing else around that person is part of his being there, then it's a very weak being there. Maybe physically it works. But being there means that this whole thing is me. Who makes a place for Hashem? If it's really going to be the dira, the dwelling place in the lowest world, which is this world, the world itself, the creations themselves are going to express godliness. That, that's what means that Hashem is there. Hashem is there. Imagine a person puts his suit in the house, takes a long stick, puts a nail in there, puts it on a hook, and puts it in the house. My suit is there. Okay, but you're not there. What does it mean I'm there? I'm in the room. Yeah, but you're not. The room is not you, so you're not in the room. You're situated physically because this whole business of space and all that messes up our, our thinking. But really, being someplace means that the place that I'm in is full of me. Every part of it. There's nothing that repels it. If something doesn't absorb it, then it's not there in that, in that aspect. And that's not called being there in a realist way possible. My main place of being, my main place of being that the whole place is about me. So in the, in, in when you talk about godliness, you're talking about everything in that place that I am expresses godliness. So if this world doesn't express godliness, then Hashem is not really here. It's just a fake. It's superficial. It's a cover-up. Fake news. That doesn't mean you're here. Rebbe Bay Fabrengen once talked about a chassid. He says, is this chassid here? Yeah, he's here. He said, he might be here, but he didn't arrive yet. There's being here and there's arriving. You could be someplace and have no clue. person could be sleeping and be taken through the whole Disney World. Were you at Disney World? Sure. If you didn't experience it, if you did, it didn't, there was no relation, then you weren't there. Physically, you were there. Very good. You could say that your, your body touched the soil. But that's not called there. So we have to be the ones. We, what is our mission? Our main mission is Dira Serving Hashem, 
so we can elevate the world to go someplace else and bring back everything to its roots. And so we can go back to our root. Tshuva, tov, shuv, hey. Hey goes on the Shama also. Return. And the soul comes down here and then it wants to return and it works its way back by doing the right things and, and fulfilling its purpose for coming down in the first place. But, th- but that is not the ultimate purpose for creation. The ultimate purpose for creation is that this is, this is the destination. This is the final destination. This is where everything is going to be visibly full of godliness. And this is going to be where the main revelation of godliness is. Yeah, sounds like Basilagani. That's really what it was, where it was when the world was created. Okay, so when you talk about Dida B'Tachtoinim, It brings in a whole different dimension in why Ashkoch uh, is so important. This thing could be waiting. That brook was waiting since the Baal told, I think his name is Chaim Rappaport. The Baal said that this brook is waiting for thousands of years since the world was created that someone should make a, a bracha on it. And now, the brook is finally fulfilled its, pers- its purpose for existing. So all these things that I'm just, I know I'm busy, I'm busy. I'm not applying myself. I'm not giving it its true existence. And I'm not making it ready for the Abisha to be here. I left something out. There's something in Hashem's palace that is contrary to Hashem. Imagine you has an enemy. An enemy king. In one of the rooms is a picture of that guy. That means that room is not a place for the king. That means the whole house is not entirely for the king. That means it, even wherever else he is, he's not really in that house. Because the house means the whole house. When we observe and we understand and we recognize Hashem's presence in something, we're giving it its legitimacy. We're actually redeeming that particular, the spark, the godly spark that's in it. And we're giving it a purpose and a reason for being created. And we're making the, play, the world and that creation something that's a dwelling for Hashem. Okay, so now, what else is Ashkoch uh, HaPratis? Um, what else is Ashkoch HaPratis? Involve and it's together with the It's together with everything else. It involves avoida. What's the difference between Ashgacha Pratis and miracles? Ooh, I see the hand of Hashem because this happened yesterday and later I saw that today. And it was punked when I was there and I was supposed to be someplace else. And amazingly, the guy that I met by mistake, he took that particular thing that I needed so badly from him. So the chances of meeting him and the chance that he will have it and the chance of this and chance of that and a million other things. Oh, wait, it has to be Hashem. He made it happen. So what's the difference between that and a miracle? A miracle is something that doesn't leave any room for curiosity, for, for, um, for finding, for exposing, for revealing. The miracle is doing the whole job. The miracle is what... Is telling you everything. There's no, there's, there's no need. If someone bops the other guy over the head with a two by four, he doesn't have to figure out that he was hit by a two by four, because it's pretty obvious, or that he was hit in the head very hard. Maybe he didn't see the two by four. So the miracle doesn't leave room for avoid the typical miracle. A miracle that comes through nature is the idea of of seeing it and connecting the dots. The only thing is Ashgach HaPratis is for each individual separately. And usually when you say a miracle, it's for the public. It's for a group of people in a certain place or in the whole world. Ashgach HaPratis means like a GPS. I have my Ashgach HaPratis. He has his Ashgach HaPratis. She has her Ashgach HaPratis. And you can have simultaneously so many different Ashgach HaPratis and so many different interpretations and so many different events happening to the people in the same room and it's totally extremely different from one extreme to the other. That's Ashgach Pratis. 
And that's Diri B'tachtenu on the most personalized level possible. So, what is the job? The job is the job. It's more about the job than what the job is about. The Eibishter wants a partner. And if he has a partner down here, then this partner is part of the Diri B'tachtenu. And the partner is so much like all the other things that exist down here in the sense that the person is a physical person with physical conditions, with dimensions and all that, that this person is, has, has, he's like the agent that could work with all the other creations, although there's such a huge difference between them, but there's more the same than, than not the same. And this is the work that comes from the Tachtin. The work that means... The Eibishter went out of his way to create a situation that he doesn't have, that it shouldn't be done by him. If the Eibishter did it, boom! But then it's not Tachtoinim. And if it's Tachtoinim, and it's not made by the Tachtoinim, and it's not done by the Tachtoinim, then again it's not real Tachtoinim. So now we understand suddenly, I have to be me. And Davka me and not him. And Davka me and not an angel. And Davka me not someone that's either taller or shorter. And Davka me because I represent the variables that exist in the whole world. Because that's what makes the world a tachting. Because it has so many differences, which means gvul, limitation, and low, lowest form of creation. So now, besides me filling myself up with awareness for Hashem, and I'm connected to Hashem so much, I'm doing something much more important. Because it's not about me only. It's about Hashem. And Hashem created the world. He was down here. His Iker was down here. And he wants to go back here very badly. And he's in jail. Because we're holding the key. And he gave us the choice. And he gave us the... the, the, the the free choice to do it or not to do it, to do it now or to delay. That's, that's a big responsibility. And that's where it's at. So now we understand that it's not only what I see, it's me seeing it. And it's not only that it happened with something, but that it happened with that specific thing. And this is all part of something the Abishta created the world for that is only going to happen through us. And Abishta got himself some very capable partners uh, sometimes. And if he did it himself, he would avoid a lot of uh, uh, displeasure. But that's what brings Hashem pleasure because we are who we are. It's like looking at the little child doing something as bad as it's done, building something, building a model sukkah, three-year-old. I don't think it's the most perfect sukkah, but <laughs> that's the pleasure. And that's the dira b'tachtainim. I want you, with your limitations, with your simplicity, I want you to make me a house. And it's so dear to me because it came from you. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about... Um, What's the Futsu Manasech of Chutzah? Why is this such an obsession with the wellsprings of Chassidus being spread all the way to the outside? What are we with outside? What's wrong with having a lot of it? One million pounds of Chassidus in this zone that can be spread over a million miles, but we'll keep it concentrated. What's the difference? The difference is if it's Chutzah, if it's outside, that's where it's virgin territory. It's territory that needs to be conquered because it's holding back everything. And there's a bigger score when you reach those places. Because that's the whole idea of Tachtan. It's more of a Tachtan. Further away, away from any connection to Yiddishkeit. That's where it's at. And so we have a Fatsas of Ayanus Chutzah, which is Chsidis. Not just Judaism, not just Matzah and, 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 and the Menorah. Of course, all that we do too, because we infuse it with Hasidus, which is all one and the same. The pnimius, the inner dimension of, of everything, is what everything is all about. 
The menorah is not just a menorah, matzah, not just matzah, it's matzah, it's a mitzvah and a mitzvah. But what explains us what this is and what gives us that awareness of Hashem, the people that we're teaching it to, I'm talking about, inside the person's heart is a love for Hashem and a fear of Hashem. That's going to be Hasidus. And that's the real deal because Hashem goes all the way into his heart and all the way into his mind. Not just the things around him. I use my table for a sukkah. Were you in the sukkah? And I was busy playing uh, volleyball. Oh, my table's, my table's very godly. Hashem wants to be in you. Hashem wants to be in everything. You go with Chassidus, you get into every little aspect of, of, of existence. It's the story of the Rebbe. The Rebbe wrote this himself in his notes that was discovered after Gimel Tamas in the Rebbe's holy room, which is called Kodesh Kodashim, Kodesh Kodashim. And the story is fascinating. The story is going to open up our eyes to what we're doing here, not here in this room necessarily, what the mission of the Rebbe is, and what the mission is to go and get towards Mashiach and finally have Mashiach, and why it's only happening after everything that happened until this point, and why everything that we've been witnessing over the past years has been a rush to the finish line. That means it was the end game, sliding into home. And that is, the story goes, it was in Tafresh Tzadik Gimel. I don't know how these years, I never could do it. Math is my strong point that I humble myself with. No, 40 years, Tafresh Tzadik Gimel was 40 years later is what? Yeah, 19, 1943, right? In 1943, the, the, the Friedrich Kerebe was in Europe, in, in Warsaw, and the, the Rebbe was married to Rebbe Zechayim Bushka, got married five years before that, or six years before that. Huh? 33, sorry. Yeah. 33, whatever. I don't do the, the, the secular not years because I get mixed up. So I finished the Gimel. Yud Beis Kislev. The Rebbe walks over to the... The Friedrich Rebbe walks over to the Rebbe and says, for the dream I had this past night, you got to put down mashka on the table, which means we really got to analyze it and live with it. And the Friedrich Rebbe continues and tells the Rebbe, give me a kiss. Friedrich Rebbe kisses the Rebbe on his cheek. And again, I'm not responsible for any details, but I'm just giving you the general way that I remember it. And it tells the Rebbe to give the Rebbe, to give him a kiss, the Friedrich Rebbe says. The Rebbe says, I gave him my hand out of respect. And the Rebbe says, no. Friedrich Krebs says, no, I want you to kiss me on my head. And the Rebbe kiss, says he kissed him on his forehead, which is the least, you know, this, how do I say it? It's self-understood. And Friedrich Rebbe continues to say the story. I dreamt that my father came to me. And he said to me, Yosef Yitzchok, why are you so down? In your house, it's light in the night. It's lichtig by nacht. And I wake up and I look and I see the room is lit up from the moon. It's an unusual, it's a very, it's a full moon, obviously. I mean, I'm assuming. And it was a strong moon that night. There were no clouds. Again, I'm assuming, but the moon was strong that night. But it was miraculous here. It was just saying that the room was lighter than other nights. And I thought that's what my father meant. He's saying this to the Rebbe. But then I said to myself, nah. That's what Friedrich Rebbe said. He said, nah, like I'm saying it. But I said, no, that's, 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 it's got to be something else. And I walk out of my room and I walk through the house and I pass the study and I look inside and there you were studying. 
This is like 3, 4 a.m., middle of the night, you know, late, late night. Not just middle of the night, like, you know, 11 o'clock at night. You call him, you so late. Feel you could have a, when he was arrested, he was asked eating supper, 12 o'clock at night, because he was busy taking uh, private people for private matters, uh, as it's uh, indicated. Um, and that's what I, that's when I understood. That's basically where it finishes. But somebody once fabrained with this, and he said, the message is so powerful. We could perhaps say that the Frida Kareba was battling with darkness. The, B- the Frida Kareba was struggling with the enemies and the opponents of Kedusha. He was battling with the, with, with the dirtiest, with the lowest, with the most black kind of existences that there is. I don't mean anything about that. And the Friedrich Rebbe knows that someone's got to take it to the next step because although the Friedrich Rebbe had major victories, the Friedrich Rebbe defeated the communists. The Friedrich Rebbe managed to spread Judaism now in Poland. And there was a lot of amazing stuff. So he should come out feeling, wow, what I got away with, uh, how I overcame this struggle is phenomenal. But... Mashiach is going to turn over the darkness to light, which means the darkness will vanish. The darkness is going to scream, Abishta. The darkness itself will be light. That's what it says in the Pasuk. The night will shine like the day. That's a different story. That's when you turn the corner already, when you're by the by the Geula. And he was, wonder, he was thinking to himself, how am I going to get, how, where do I see in, in, in where we are now, where do I see the end? When everything is going to scream Abishta, it's not going to end up just being the Yid withdrawing, disconnecting from Gashmis of the world. And that's why I was upset. But when I saw you, I understood. And if there's anything the Rebbe did that nobody else did, well, a small accomplishment, took over the Gashmis of the world and brought out in every aspect of Gashmis its godliness and showed us how much the world itself is contributing. Together with the conditions, it's not just that the Rebbe did it and the Fidik Rebbe couldn't do it, it's a process. And that's why the Rebbe tells us to open our eyes. There's many, many different indications of what the Rebbe says and how we can understand it. I have it all on here, but I'm ready over time. Next week is a different topic, but I might sneak it in and go with this stuff because what I have to say after this is, is incredible. When we start understanding that the whole Ashkoch protest is not just a witness, you're not just a, 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 a spectator, but you're helping to cause it. And without your input and your recognition, it, 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 it's missing. You're needed to make it happen. It's almost like you're giving that thing its existence only by noticing it. I, once, I don't know anything about science. <laughs> but I can tell you that since Reb Sra'a Ari Leib, Reb's brother, he was a mathematician and all that, and science and all that. And I know that one time I was listening to these um, Rabbi Silman, Rabbi Shimon Silman, he has a, a seminar, he has a, a, a convention, and they discuss all these things in the light of science. And he spoke about something called quantum physics. I sound like I know what I'm talking about because I know the word. But quantum physics is a new kind of discovery that it reacts acts based on the observer. If there's an observer, it'll do one, it'll do this or that, and it changes. The whole idea of Ashgach Pratis is you are an active participant, you're a partner with the Ebishta. And and Ashgach Pratis means that if you don't discover this, if you don't reveal it, if you don't bring it out, it's not there. And that's why it's so important. I wanted to explain more about how 
Mashiach comes into the picture, which is totally incredible. And, and why Hashkoch Pratis is like never before, because all the other things that are happening and that happened in the past continued, and there was more to the story. But now, at the end of days, when the whole avoid of Hashkoch Pratis, which is very strongly connected to Rabbi Sabirurin, because you're freeing something from being stuck in a in 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 in, 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 in non kedusha, you don't have to free anything when Mashiach comes. It's not going to be any non kedusha. It's not going to be anything outside of kedusha. So the whole of the practice is to notice the godliness within this thing. So the story is a story, is a story, is a story, but it but it, but it continues. Now we can't leave any open stories because now all the stories have to close. You know, you open up all those windows, 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 because you finished doing your work on the computer and the battery's dying. You gotta close all the windows. We have to be able to close all the windows of everything that's been going on all these years since the world was created. And it has to make sense and it has to point to the direction of Hashem Yim Lechleil Vod. And that's why it's so special, Ashkoch Abrotis. It's in everything, and it's part of everything, and it is everything, especially Geula. Chaim.